We're going to want exercises that give us as much of stimulus as possible. We then look at fatigue and go, okay, which one of these exercises fucks our joints and connective tissues up the least? Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. And I have a question for you. What is the best exercise for you to grow from for any specific muscle? If you don't know the answer, staying tuned could be helpful. So we have a question that we're asking, but we can ask it a little bit more formally. And here's the more formal ask. It is, which exercise stimulates the most muscle growth per unit of time that you do it? We'll just say per set. So if you do one set of hack squats versus one set of leg presses, which one grows more muscles in your quadriceps, for example? But that question is a little bit incomplete because it presupposes that we only train once. If you train once, a lot of right answers appear, but what about for the long term? Because you don't grow much muscle just training at one time. A good exercise is a good exercise if it can repeatedly be employed in your program, something like gee whiz, once a week, twice a week in some cases, for weeks and weeks on end, if it can consistently grow you muscle, that's a really, really good thing. So if you have an exercise that stimulates the most muscle in, a, for example, a set unit of volume, but also does this with minimal fatigue so that you can come back and hit that exercise again productively half a week or a week later over and over and over that really does answer the question pretty well or start to get at the, at least formulating the question of what it is that we're looking for. So the best exercise for muscle growth is one that most robustly stimulates muscle growth in a single session of measurement, but also accumulates the smallest amount of fatigue for that muscle growth such that you are really fresh and ready injury free to come back next time and hit that shit again and again and again. It's kind of like if you think about it, sort of like dating, how many people out there exist for you to have a really good time with on one date? Oh, uh, lots, totally. How many people out there can have a great time with you on 10 dates in a row? That pool almost mathematically has to shrink because one circle envelops the other one completely and that intersection is usually very complete, but it's quite small. So the number of exercises that can stimulate muscle growth once, and then you're like, ah, my knees hurt. I can't keep doing this. My knees will fall off. That's a big category. It's a smaller category. So okay, of these exercises, which ones are the least fatiguing and thus most productive over and over and over? Date number seven, you're still laughing away. Oh my God, Kara, <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> Get me out of here. Huh? I've never said that in a date because I've never been on a date. Now, how do we figure out how much muscle and exercise grows? In the laboratory, we can do this by having you do three sets of squats, having another person do three sets of hack squats, or shit, I'll give you even one better. With one leg, you do three sets of leg presses. With another leg, you do three sets of leg extensions, one leg at a time. We take physically a gigantic needle, we stick it into your quad, and it pulls out a small fraction of your quad muscle. What? Yep, it's called a muscle biopsy. Standard operating procedure in exercise science. Terrible to think about, but that's how we get the facts out, literally, of your body. We do that to your quads on the side you did the leg press. We do that on the quad on the side that you did the leg extension. And we actually can measure a few different things. One of them is how much the machinery of muscle growth, like the mTOR pathway, for example, is activated. We can also do some studies where we put a tracer through, which is radioactive labeling and water that you drink or something, the protein that you take in, and you see how much of that protein, actually many of those amino acids get accreted and put into that new muscle to say, well, you know, after a, a, some time with radioactive labeling, we realize that uh, the leg press side actually led to more muscle accretion in that area than the leg extension side, so on and so forth. There's a couple ways to do it, but gee whiz, most of them require something really invasive if you're gonna go in there one time. There are less invasive ways to do it. You can get people training for eight weeks with just leg press, eight weeks with just leg extension on one side or the other, and then you can do an ultrasound measurement to see how thick the muscle was before, how thick it was halfway through, even shit, once a week if you want, and then how thick it was at the end to say, okay, the leg press side grew whatever number of millimeters more muscle, and thus it is better from a muscle growth perspective. That's all good and well, but are you going to do that for yourself? Because we're talking, this whole video is about the best muscle growth exercise 
for you. Not some puny Harry Potter look like student in Sweden. Hey, no offense, Swedes. You guys just have an excellent exercise science research laboratory situation over there. But, you know, just because Hans or Olaf managed to grow a little bit more muscle with leg press and leg extension, it might not apply to you. So we need to know how you're going to do. And thus, what we're going to do is try to establish some proxies of muscle growth. By proxies, we mean variables we can measure or at least intuit a little bit in the real world day to day to day that hint at how much stimulus for muscle growth that exercise is probably causing. Big probably, but way better than nothing. And sure, shit, way better than getting your fucking muscle ripped out of your leg or moving to Sweden for eight weeks to do a study on yourself. Unless you're really into white chicks. You know what I'm saying, fellas? See you there. It's cold. But lots of white chicks. In any case, we need proxies. We need reliable, decent, not perfect, estimates at comparing two different ways of training to seeing which one probably stimulates more muscle growth. And while we're at it, we'd love some proxies for fatigue as well. How do we know how much fatigue you're accumulating? Well, there's hints. We can absolutely hint at the situation. And here's how. We have a list of five stimulus proxies and three fatigue proxies. Again, these are ways of trying to tell probably, maybe, better than a random guess, how much muscle growth is an exercise causing, typically in one session, and how much fatigue is it accumulating for you, also in one session. Because we know that if fatigue accumulation is really high in session number one, it's probably going to get high and keep being high in sessions two, three, four, five, six, and then you won't be nearly as sustainable with that progression. So on the stimulus side, we have tension, which is how much you feel that the target muscle is being tensed and pulled apart. That when you do bicep curls heavy and you pull on the bar, you feel that bicep just crunch up and you're like, holy shit, I sure hope shit doesn't come popping off. If an exercise that's supposed to train a muscle doesn't generate a ton of tension seemingly in the muscle, it's difficult to see how that's going to relate to the best possible growth because there is a chance like it is generating a ton of tension, you just can't perceive it, but that chance is much lower than, well, gee whiz, it's just not generating a ton of tension. For example, if I had you do a huge bicep curl set and you're like, wow, my muscles are, my biceps are just really tensed up, especially at the bottom stretch, I can ask you a question and say, how much tension do you feel in your triceps? You'd be like, well, I don't think a lot. And they did some kind of co-contraction to control, but nothing I can really feel like it's pulling the muscle apart. You'd be like, well, it turns out the bicep curl is the best exercise for tricep growth. And you'd be like, what the fuck? What? That's nonsense. Here's another example. If I have you do a squat and you do it in such a way that you're like, dude, I feel my glutes tearing apart, man. I just feel them just ripping. And I'm like, what about your quads? And you're like, meh. Am I really so sure that that's the best quad exercise for you, that that technique with you doing the squats is going to get your quads growing? And if you were curious, you'd be like, hey, look, uh, is this training my quads? And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And you say, well, I really just feel it almost entirely in my glutes. Would you really find it convincing if I was like, ah, nah, that doesn't mean anything. That's all perception. Now, perception can be wrong. Perception can be meaningless. But is it more likely to be meaningless than not? Probably not. So we'll take tension. We'll put it into our little bag of tricks our little bag of stimulus proxies and move on to the next. The burn. There's two types of burn. One is the accumulation of metabolites in and around your muscle that physically hurts you during high repetition sets. And the second type is you've been doing a lot of partying and it hurts to pee and you need to go see your doctor as soon as possible, certainly before your next sexual encounter. I'm sure most of you on the channel have been at least in that second situation. So let's just talk about the first. The burn is interesting because it gives us two reasons to believe it relates to hypertrophy. Tension is one of the main variables that causes growth. Muscle tension generated by the target muscle physically through mechanotransduction. There's cell signaling pathways that literally like, holy shit, there's tons of tension. Grow muscle and tell your nucleus to go do all that shit. The burn also has a similar thing. The metabolites that accumulate in and around your muscle, especially inside, seem to have, according to the latest research, and quite a bit of it, I would say, 
mechanistic effects on growth, which is to say that, for example, lactate, which is a metabolite, if you're producing a ton of lactate through a few other ways, including direct, you'll feel that shit, you are going to be signaling muscle growth to occur. So the burn tells you that, look, muscle growth is probably being stimulated if your muscle really, really burns. Another thing we know about muscle growth from past studies is that training very close to failure also causes a lot of hypertrophy. And gee whiz, you're probably pretty close to failure if you're getting a burn in the muscle. So it checks that box. And it also gives us that targeting, that specificity element. If you're doing curls and the reason you're stopping the set is your forearms are on fire, it is probably more accurate to say that that is a forearm exercise for you than a bicep exercise. If you just don't feel any tension or any burn in your biceps, but your forearms are just completely burned to shit, you have to drop the weight, go, ah, 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 help, you're yelling help in the gym. Man, there's something going on in your forearms that sure as shit seems like it's stimulating hypertrophy. But in the classic case, if you're doing pec flies for high reps and your chest is searing with pain, you know, gee whiz, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, probably not even an exercise scientist or sports scientist to say, yeah, like, I think probably some muscle growth could result from that versus you're doing pec flies for really high reps and you're like, I don't feel shit. My front delts really hurt. Man, I'm just not so confident saying, no, 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 don't worry. It's your pecs that are growing. And you're like, well, aren't, isn't it just front delts? You're like, nah, nah, they're, they're not involved at all. That's just where you feel the burn, but not where it's happening. That's not how that works. Number three, if you submit a lot of tension and a lot of burn through close to failure and or heavy training in sets of five to 30 reps, inevitably you will get a pump of some kind, which is the cell swelling of all the muscle cells inside your muscle. And it looks cool and it feels cool. That's when you get big dick energy and confidence. Finally ask out that front desk girl. You got a big bicep pump. She's like, oh my God. Ah. And you're like, yeah, you like look like that. She's like, yeah. You're like, yeah, you fucking, you want to like, you want to go on a date? And she's like, yeah, can we just like go in the locker room and go on a date right now? And you're like, holy shit, fuck yeah, pump. That's what the pump does. Guaranteed to get you laid instantly. But it also has better benefits than that. Better than instant laying. Mike, please tell us more. Oh, don't worry, I will. The pump, cell swelling itself, has also been mechanistically tied to hypertrophy, which is to say that cells that swell seemingly accrete proteins and actually grow bigger. So if you get a cell to swell temporarily and then come back down, that cell in many cases has more cell structures a few minutes, hours, and days later, it grows bigger in a sense, preparing for the next round of swelling. The pump by itself probably isn't a huge stimulator of hypertrophy, very, very small. But if you got a very good pump, that probably means you pushed close to failure. That probably means you did a workout that had five to 30 rep sets in it, and it probably means the muscle that was pumped did a lot of that tension generation and a lot of that metabolite generation. It would be really confusing if you were training your chest and you have fuck load of tension on the flies, a shitload of burn on the machine presses, and then the biggest pump in your body was your forearms or your calves. How does it work like that? Your forearms and calves didn't do much. They're not getting a big pump. But if your chest did a ton, it usually gets a huge pump and that's a very good sign. Again, not the perfect sign, a probabilistic sign. Better than chance that you're doing some good muscle growth things. So we have tension, we have burn, we have pump. All those three things together give us independent hints that we're probably on the right track, which is to say exercises that really drive those shits at a high level, exercise which you know, gives tons of tension to the target muscle, a ton of burn to the target muscle at higher reps, and it gives you enormous pumps just a few sets in to the exercise. Man, that's probably not a bad exercise for muscle growth. That's a really good thing. We have two other things that we can look at. Number four is perturbation. Perturbation. You consider yourself very perturbed. How dare you, sir? A white glove comes off. Slap. Trade hands with the glove. Slap. Put glove back on. The aristocratic days. The good times. The 1890s. Oh, when I was born as a vampire, of course. Perturbation is a term I sure shit just came up with at RP. There's nothing in the literature that described this. Is a term we give to the weakness, strange proprioceptive feeling, and interesting contractility, which means you try to contract your muscle and not a lot happens, 
or you try to contract it and it cramps up, that is a result of the punishing stimulus of multiple effective sets. Real easy to imagine this. Just go right now. Don't do this. This is a joke. Do 100 sets of leg presses with your 15 RM. Sorry, 100 sets. Good God. 100 total. And you might die from that. 100 total reps. <laughs> Scott, the video guy, love that one. He loves death. 100 total reps with your 15 RM on the leg press. It's going to take you a lot of sets. Don't actually do this. Cut this in half. Just do 50. And you are going to feel very perturbed. How exactly? First of all, you'll be so weak. Because remember, strength loss in the local muscle of interest is a big thing. You'll be so weak, you'll be able to get barely out of the leg press, okay? Your quads won't really feel like they're a part of your body because if you do something athletic, you're like, ooh, 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 ooh. You feel really wobbly. You feel like, man, like I try to contract my quads. Seemingly not a lot happens. Like there's some weird mind-muscle connection lag there completely. And also, to the point of perturbation, there's a situation that if you step on the stairs, your quads could give out, failure to contract, or you sort of lock out your knee and your quad cramps like crazy. That's the worst shit in the world. You're like, ah, that, if that stuff doesn't happen, you absolutely could have still driven in a ton of muscle growth, no worries at all. But if that stuff does happen to your muscle, after you have pushed a shitload of tension and berm and pump, et cetera, into it, that's probably really stimulated for growth. And it could be so fucked up that it's so damaged that it doesn't grow or grows less because you overdid the stimulus. But that's the kicker. You sure shit didn't understimulate. You don't come out of a fucking tanning bed, beat fucking red, and parts of you are black and crackling and there's smoke. And someone's like, yeah, I think you underdid the suntan. You're definitely not the ideal tan and you need more. Uh uh uh. You did too much. But at least we know the fucking bulbs work. Stimulus is not the problem. As a matter of fact, turn down that shit and you'll have a much better time next year when you recover of full body skin cancer. Just the same way, if a, an exercise totally fucks you up to the point where you can barely use the muscles, stimulus is not the problem. And if it takes one or two sets of an exercise, you get on a leg press, three sets later you can barely walk versus what exercise do we want to pick on? Partial rep squats with a wide stance. Three sets later, someone's like, hey, how are your quads feel with a partial rep? And you're like, I don't know. Well, just fine. I can jump high. I can run pretty fast. My muscles feel like nothing happened because nothing really fucking happened. But with the leg press, if your shit gets fucked up, with any muscle, any exercise in a few sets versus another exercise where it takes more sets to fuck it up or there doesn't seem to be a number of sets that fucks it up. Eight sets later on wide stance squats, you're like, I, my, my groin hurts and you can feel nothing in my legs. The stimulus is probably bigger where you see the most perturbation. Lastly is disruption. And that we categorize to the feeling of weakness and tightness in the several hours after training, all the way up to the soreness that you experience hours and days after termed delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS for short. That again is not a requirement of growth. You could get incredible growth and never ever get sore. But if you're getting reliably sore from an exercise, you could have 99 reasons you're not growing from it, but the stimulus is not one of them. There's not a fucking universe in which you get completely top to bottom, left to right, totally sore to the touch, ow, pecs, and someone's like, yeah, man, the reason your chest is small is you fucking need to train harder. What the fuck? If I trained harder, would my pecs fall off and then crawl back on my body bigger once they've eaten the fish food in the corner of my room? What the fuck does that even mean? If you're getting sore and barely recovering for your next session from one or two sets of stiff-legged deadlifts, the stiff-legged deadlift is an unreal stimulative exercise. And if that shitty leg curl in the corner in your gym, you do five sets on, and then the next day you sort of feel your hamstrings are maybe tired, but really they're not, I wouldn't bet that that's a better stimulus than the stiff-legged deadlift, which clearly fuck you up more. Because it, again pushed a shitload of tension through those muscles and a crap load of metabolites and all that causes delayed onset soreness and even proximate sort of fatigue slash tightness and soreness to occur. And what I'm talking about with that is, let's say you get out of the car three or four hours after doing legs. If you were in the car the whole time after legs, gee, you really have it coming. You're not sore yet. You don't have DOMS. It's not sore to the touch, but you get out of the car and you're like, holy shit, your legs feel tight. You're kind of just trying to move your quads around and your knees. You're like, oh my God, 
something has been, drum roll, disrupted. And that's a really good stimulus proxy for growth. One of five, one of five, it's not the only one, but check this out. Here's how we use these five proxies. If you go through a checklist and you say, okay, I got tension, I got burn, not a big pump, got perturbed, got sore as fuck, that's four out of five, that's pretty good. You another exercise for the same muscle group, you work just as hard, three sets for both, two different days, months apart or weeks apart, and you're like, yeah, this other exercise, I got good tension, no burn, no pump, perturbation was meh, and honestly, I just didn't get sore. For three sets versus three sets, I'm just betting on the margins that that first exercise that hit more of those check boxes is more likely to have caused more muscle growth. There are no guarantees in this business. Well, as far as I know, just yet. Hopefully genomics can solve that problem. No guarantees. Working on probabilities. Working on likelihoods, right? So, you know, if you are trying to ask a girl out and you are an eight yourself as a guy and you're going only after tens, there is a probability some angel bitch 10 comes down from heaven and goes, yay, short king, come with me. And you know what I'm saying? You're hitting it up. But if you're seeing a shitload of sixes and you're a fucking eight, there's just a higher chance one of them is going to say yes. I don't know anything about dating. I make this up on the spot. But like, it's all probabilities. But if you have an exception to the rule of that these things don't correlate to growth, by all means, share it in the comments. We'd love to hear about it. But exceptions are just that. They're illustrative of the rules. Because a tiny little 130-pound person beat up someone who was 400 pounds doesn't mean you're like, yeah, man, when I look at two guys, if they could fight, I don't even look at body weight. That would be insane. That would mean the UFC is just wrong for having weight classes. So I digress. It's all probabilities. It's all chance. But we boost our chance if we check a lot of those boxes for the stimulus proxies being there and being greater in magnitude. Tons of tension versus a bit. Huge pump versus a little versus not having nearly as many of those boxes to check in one exercise compared to another. Now, on to fatigue. We have the stimulus covered. We know what those proxies are. What about fatigue? We have three things to consider. The first is joint and connective tissue discomfort. If your, your gym got a new bicep curl machine, then every time you're here doing it, you're like, my elbows fucking hurt. Ow, ow, ow. Fuck this. Fuck. I'm going to use another exercise now, go to the dumbbell curls, and you're like, Jesus Christ, my elbows still hurt from this shit. And it takes you three or four days for your elbows to actually feel good again. Are you even going to use that machine again? The answer is maybe not. Not for a long time. Like, clearly, I did something wrong where the machine is fucking poorly designed, just causes a lot of joint and connective tissue discomfort. There's another way this can go. You can start using an exercise, and I highly recommend using an exercise for at least a mesocycle four to eight weeks of more and more difficult training to really get a feel for it. Unless it's physically hurting your joints like crazy, then absolutely stop. But if it feels a little weird, that new hack squat machine kind of makes your knees feel not so great, but not terrible, give it a few rounds, give it a few sessions, give it a few weeks. And if it starts to feel better on your knees, hey, you're well on your way. If it feels worse and worse on your knees, either make a technique adjustment or get the fuck out because that's clearly having so much of a fatigue effect on your local joint ultrastructure that you might not want to fucking bet the house on it. You know, like, you know what? This is not my ticket to big legs because I'll for sure get a ticket to bad knees before I ever get big legs. So joint and connective tissue discomfort is, again, on a scale. Nothing almost ever in the gym will feel like pure magic fairy dust on your joints. It's unlikely to have an exercise that's difficult to do and you're doing it close to failure, sets of 5 to 30, that your joints feel like better after than before. Maybe if I'm warming up and feeling it out. But there's going to be some kind of discomfort in your joints. You know, even pull-ups, which my joints love at the bottom, I'm like, ooh, my shoulders. It's not a bad thing, but I was like, oh, shit's happening. But it ranges all the way up to like one rep of this is prohibitively painful for the joint in question. Fuck that. All the exercises are somewhere in between. Where in between they are compared to each other is how you rank them. If you have an exercise like a leg press versus hack squat, the leg press hits all the same stimulus proxies as the hack squat on average, like right? a little bit more of some, a little bit less of others, but generally they seem to be just as stimulative as each other for a set of, you know, for three sets or something like that. If the leg press feels pretty fucking good on your knees and hips and back, but the hack squat, not so much on any of those, which one is your more likely ticket to better gains? Which one is the better exercise for you, at least in the moment? 
it's probably leg press because you can go in, you can load it appropriately, you can progress through it, not have to worry about your joints falling apart halfway through a session. Number two, so we got joint connective tissue discomfort. Number two is perceived psychological exertion. Given that the stimulus proxies are the same for two exercises, we have to judge the exercises on how much life force they drain away from you. If there's an exercise you hate to do, or an exercise that seems to require just unbelievable amounts of fucking willpower and guts, it's great to do for psychological development. But ostensibly, you're training enough that psychological development happens one way or another. It's either going to happen with effective exercises that don't drain the shit out of you, or more exercises, or sorry, fewer sets of an exercise that's not as effective, it drains the dog shit out of your brain juices, that's a technical term, and you're just not interested in doing a whole lot more work, and you have really trouble motivating yourself, and all this other stuff. Psychological fatigue is also a real thing. It spills over into physical fatigue through a bunch of systems, so if an exercise really beats you up in the brain, it's likely you'll actually start to get weaker earlier in your program. You'll miss a few weeks on the tail end of getting stronger and having great training. Let me give you guys an example. If you do a full range of motion barbell bent row with a big stretch at the bottom and a big contraction at the top, sets of 15, you could get a fucking gnarly back pump, trap pump, everything, tension, soreness, etc. You could also get roughly the same stimulus for your back in this hypothetical case and in the real world oftentimes by doing rack deadlifts, partial deadlifts, with like three times more weight than you row. It crushes the fucking spine. And in order for that bar to even come up on the first rep, you've got to really find some fucking demons in your head, put your fucking war death metal in your earbuds. After a set of rows, you're like, hell yeah, man, I feel fucking great. I can do four or five more sets of this and get four or five, another additional stimuli of more and more muscle growth. With the partial deadlifts, with the rack deadlifts, one set, and you're sitting there after like, fuck, I felt like I just got out of Vietnam for the love of God. Shit was fucking hard. It took every ounce of my willpower to do what? To lift more weight? Check, sweet. But what about those stimulus proxies? For the same stimulus proxies, you're working harder. Folks, please do not misunderstand me. There is a situation in which hard work is good for its own sake. I am not dogging on hard work. But I assume your program for training is so big, so meaty, so imposing that your ability to work hard comes at a finite bandwidth. You've got to be smart about what you work hard on. You, you probably won't find a lot of billionaires working their asses off for a dollar an hour. Now, you'll find a lot of billionaires working their asses off for fucking millions of dollars an hour or whatever the fuck much billionaires make. You think, well, hold on a sec. Why don't they grind on a job? The real analogy is they got millions of dollars per hour in one job, same millions in another job, but that other job fucking is just hard on them psychologically. They have to try infinity harder in order to get the job done. They come home. Their fatigue is higher. They sleep more poorly. They have poor social relations. And after a year, the wife or the you know, stepmom that still lives with you, even though you're a billionaire, is like, I can't do this anymore, Frank. You've been miserable at home. You're not sleeping. You're not eating. Your body's gone. You're like that one motherfucker. What's his name from The Machinist? He's got the video guy. Christian Bale. Christian Bale from The Machinist. Fuck, are you looking like that for? And you think to yourself, gee whiz, you know, I can actually make the same money just as ethically, just as productively for society if I worked half as hard for the same fucking money. Think of it like that. We're here to get the money, folks. And we'll work as hard as needed, but also as easily as needed. Imagine there's like some kind of like grip extender at Chipotle, which is where you work, and it helps you take the fucking whatever you're frying out of the fucking fryer. Does Chipotle even have a fryer? Fucking KFC. That's a real restaurant. KFC fryer extender. You don't get the oil grease on your hand. It's actually some kind of leverage mechanism. It makes you lift the chicken out of the fryer easier, faster. You help serve customers better. Now, there's a chance that you, the extender, just came off. You can just do it fucking raw with your hand. It doesn't hurt you a ton of oil sprays, whatever. But it's just like you're working harder for the same amount of money, for the same amount of tasty chicken ending up in the same number of people's mouths. Would you ever in a million years, someone's like, hey, do you want this extender thing to help you? You'd be like, nah, man, I'm here to work. Like, 
Yes, but the output of your work is happiness in people's tummies from the delicious chicken that you're helping them get, not how much of a fucking ironically bicep pump you get or how much oil spray you have on your hands. We want to work hard, but we want to do it smart. Thus, the smallest amount of psychological exertion we can give for the stimulus is a really good thing. Lastly, number three fatigue indicator is another way to get at what's called systemic fatigue. Exercises fatigue locally, but that's, you know, your bicep gets fucked up. We covered that in perturbation and disruption. That's great because that fatigue, the same things that cause it also cause muscle growth. Systemic fatigue is something that spills over. It's a change in your nervous system, in your hormones. There's all this autocrine and paracrine nonsense going on that hard exercise can degrade your ability from doing it for one muscle group to do it for another muscle group. For example, if you do some bent rows for your back, fucking hits your back up, great. After that, you're supposed to go do pull-ups. You do pull-ups, everything's great. After that, you have lateral raises. Muscles are unrelated pretty much completely, and you can still, you're not completely drained. You have still a very low amount of unrelated muscle fatigue. Your side delts feel generally totally fine. The systemic fatigue of those two exercises is really low. You can do your lateral raises, get a great shoulder pump, you're growing, everything's great. There is no avoiding hard training if you want to grow. But if you want to grow the most, your training needs to be hard and smart. RP Hypertrophy app will make sure you're progressing on track, monitoring, and adjusting your workout at all times. So for all that work you're doing, you can be sure you're getting the best results. However, if you did rack deadlifts and eccentric, super fast on the way down, completely psychotic chin-ups or something, that weird wiggling motion you do to get up to the chin-up and the almost whole body motion of the deadlift doesn't train your side delts, makes you so fucked up, so tired. You guys ever like after four sets of deadlifting be like, man, I can fucking tap dance. Nobody says that shit. You could say it after four sets of bent rows, probably not after deadlift. Those two exercise combos give you, let's say the same amount of muscle growth. Which one of those can you train your delts hard after? It sure as shit isn't the one where you're getting a ton of unrelated exercise fatigue. And the way you measure that is you know how strong you are at various points in your workout. You know how strong you are. You've done incline benches before and then dumbbell curls after. So four sets of incline barbell bench, dumbbell curls. You could do the 25 for sets of 16, let's say. And then you switch to a machine press and let's say it just, just hits your pecs just as good. But because the machine press is a little bit easier, you feel like fresher after. Your biceps, which weren't used in either movement, are not suffering from the imposition of a lot of systemic global fatigue. You can do sets of 18 now. Is sets of 18 and the strength of your local bicep musculature that allows for that going to confirm more muscle growth for you than sets of 16? Yeah, absolutely. That's two extra reps at the end of each fucking set, the very productive ones. That's the reps that get cut off. You're doing a better job training both muscle groups now. So when we're looking at our ideal exercise or what exercise is better for you rather than worse, we're going to want exercises that give us as much of stimulus as possible. But assuming all the stimuli in our example are roughly the same, we then look at fatigue and go, okay, which one of these exercises fucks our joints and connective tissues up the least? Which ones of these exercises can we do with the least amount of like tooth grinding psychological exertion, which spills into the rest of our lives and raises our cumulative fatigue such that four or five weeks in, we're going to be able to fuck this. I can't keep going versus four or five weeks in, you're like, dude, I'm still in. Let's cause more muscle growth. And lastly, which one of these exercises gives you the least unrelated and unused muscle fatigue such that you can get the big pecs that you wanted, but not have to sacrifice gains or gains or rates of gains and progressions in the rest of your muscles. Cause that would kind of be sweet. Someone's like, Hey man, I got the ultimate leg exercise. Like, what is it, bro? It's a fucking don't train the rest of your body, just train your legs. Like, okay, yeah, I figured that, man. That's not really helpful. I also want to get jacked everywhere else. Which exercise can make it so that I train the muscle, it fucks up the muscle, and it minimally affects the others? That's a really good exercise. That's a really good exercise. And so if that exercise that you found checks a lot of the boxes for stimulus and not checking a ton of boxes or checking them with a, a light pencil stroke, for fatigue, 
for now, that is a very good exercise choice for you. And if you've tried a few exercises for that muscle group, you've tried incline press with dumbbells, barbells, machines, some flies, you can probably rank order them on how much stimulus they cause, how much fatigue they cause, get roughly an understanding of which one has the best amount of stimulus, the smallest amount of fatigue, and that, folks, is the stimulus to fatigue ratio. The highest ratio means you get the most and pay the least. Imagine a burrito shop, shop A, the S-H-O-P-P-E, where you get a fucking enormous, like, oh my God, what the eggplant emoji size burrito, you know what I'm saying? And it costs $5. Stimulus, burrito measurement, unbelievable. Fatigue from spending your money, terribly difficult. Nickels are very hard to lift. You're fucking winning. Versus if you go to another restaurant, they're like, yeah, so the burrito is going to be like this big, teeny tiny, and uh, you know it's going to cost $40. You're going to be like, what the fuck? Why would I ever do that? Generally speaking, it's the same with exercises. If you have an exercise that causes enormous stimulus with a small amount of fatigue, man, it's hard to argue against it, at least for the time being. Because after a few months of using an exercise productively, it can grow stale. And that is actually a sports science term, not an analogy. The staleness is described as a slight decrease in stimulus. The exercise used to give you crazy pumps, not anymore. Now they're mediocre. Used to feel a crazy connection and tension with your muscles that you're targeting. Now you're like, I think my biceps are doing okay. Really, I'm just kind of moving the weight up and down and so on and so forth. All the stimuli kind of degrade while the fatiguing elements start to rise up a little bit used to do deficit push-ups and you were like, dude, I could do these in my sleep, man. It's just free chest gains. And now you're like grinding them and your fucking arms are shaking. And after some, you're like, holy shit, where the fuck am I? The fatigue is now higher. That happens with every single exercise over time, which is why at some point you take an exercise that used to be really good, high SFR, stimulus to fatigue ratio for you, and you replace it with an exercise that is one you used before that you knew was pretty good for you until it got stale, but it's been months since you've used it, so it's going to be nice and fresh. Or it's your turn to try a new exercise that you haven't used before, and then you get in there and you work out and you go, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, this exercise is okay. I'm going to use it for a couple of muscle cycles because all of my high SFR hitters are tired and I've benched them. They're all stale. But here's the thing about staleness. Every day, every week, and for sure every month that you're not using an exercise that got stale on you, it's refreshing. It's becoming less stale. Your body's like kind of forgetting about it. And then coming back, it's going to be like, whoa, holy shit. Uh, here's a shitty analogy I'll probably get canceled for. If you have a list of people in your phone you're hooking up with and you haven't seen one of them in like six months and she's like, hey, it's Tracy. Do you still have this number? And you're like, yo, what's up, Tracy? And she's like, I haven't seen you in a while. I'm driving through town. Ha! It's a lot of H-E-H-E-H-E. And you're like, the fuck? Doesn't she know LOL or fucking emoji? When she was in town last, you know what I'm saying? You hit it up a bunch and you're like, eh. She's like, you want to hang out again tonight? You're like, I'm busy with things. Yeah. You thought that's what you are going to say, except you just left her on red and you just threw your phone away. Uh, eight weeks later, 12 weeks later, she hits you up and you're like, yo, I haven't seen that bitch in a fucking dog's age. I'm going to hit that ASAP. And it will be nicer for the both of you because it's fresh. You keep doing it for a while, it's stale. Jeez. Sounds like the body systems, both muscular and sexual, have a lot in common. I actually did receive my PhD, and not in exercise science. Most people think that it's in sex studies. Is that a thing? Or is that just a thing my parole officer tells me not to tell people at the grocery store randomly? And also, Scott, the video guy, sorry to describe your sex life and use it as an example. It's okay. It's okay. For There's For science. There's so much sex life to talk about. In any case, that's the deal with stainless. If you don't use your best exercises for a while and find some decent replacements, after a few months, when you bring them back in, they're going to be heavy hitters again. So, insights from this talk. First, both stimulus and fatigue determine the value of an exercise for growth, not just one or the other. So if you're like, dude, this exercise really like fucks up my pecs, my next question is like, well, how does it feel in the joints? And if you're like, I don't know, man, it kind of sucks. I'm like, eh, maybe you can find an exercise that does really good with your pecs and minimally affects your joints. Number two, 
All insights from the stimulus to fatigue ratio are just rough approximations. No guarantees, no guarantees, but better than nothing. Number three, everybody is different, which means you have to try a few different exercises, giving them the due diligence of a few weeks at least each to try to see which ones work best for you. Also, which techniques using them, close stance with the squats, medium stance, wide stance, that makes a difference too. There is zero replacement of experience and experiment in your own training. So if you see five best exercises for quad growth, unless it's a nuanced video and it's just clickbait thumbnails, which we do all the fucking time, it's probably fucking bullshit because there's not five best leg exercises for the population. And even if there is, statistically, you're not the fucking population. You're you, Jim Frankford, Abbott Falls, Wisconsin, and you're a chronic masturbator, but you're really trying to read the Bible more. You need exercises that are good for you, and the only way you're going to find out is roughly, at least intuitively, tracking the stimulus to fatigue ratios of them. Now, if you have the RP training app, shit does it for you and automatically ranks your best SFR exercises as first candidates in your next program creation, but I'm just self-promoting at this point. Number four, there is no one best exercise. It could be by a small margin, but there's usually a candidacy group of three to five exercises that for you all have comparably rough SFRs. I used to have a book about dinosaurs when I was a little kid, and there was the seismosaur, the supersaur, and the ultrasaur, and they were all respectively, uh, I'm going to get the, the orders mixed up, but uh, so the seismosaur was the heaviest, I'll just go one by one, the supersaur was the longest, and the ultrasaur was the tallest. Which one's the biggest dinosaur? But the, 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 the fucking three, they're all fucking big. And if you want a big dinosaur for a birthday present, you know what I'm saying? And there's no, no losers. When people are like, what's better, hack squats or leg press or feet forward Smith machine squat? Man, for a lot of people, it's just three really awesome things. Next point, point number five, many exercises for you will have poor SFRs. There's not like a list of one or two exercises well, I shouldn't do, they're not effective. For you, there could be a list of four, five, six, and 10 exercises. So you're going to have this pool of exercises over here that's really, really good pool of exercises here that really sucks, bad SFRs, small SFRs, and some in the middle that are like sometimes they hit, sometimes not, sometimes need the right machine, sometimes the right foot stance, etc. Generally what you do is pick from the group of the best, occasionally dipping in the middle to see if you're missing out on anything, and the ones that are the worst, every now and again you come back around and say, well, I'm going to try this, see how it works, but usually you stay the fuck away from those because for you in your experience, they're not that great. And here's the thing, why do we come back around and choose the exercises outside of our best SFR candidacy group? It is because over time, SFRs can change. Your body changes, the conditions change, and your knowledge of technique and proprioception change so that you couldn't really figure out how to wiggle in the hack squat and it just hurt your knees a few years ago. Now you try hack squats, you're like, I know how to push through my heels now. Fuck, this is like the goddamn greatest leg exercise that I've ever tried. That personal story is my personal story. It happened to me with hack squat. Don't write things off forever. SFRs change over time. And an exercise you wrote off, you could at least try for a few reps in a warm up and be like, and no, fuck that. You're like, ooh, ooh, I like this. I didn't like it before, but I like it now. Insert whatever analogy fits exactly correctly into that hookup bitch we analogy with the rotation where you're like, I didn't used to, Cindy didn't used to look good, but then that damn bitch started working out. And, and uh, maybe pop extreme plastic surgery. In any case, lastly, point number seven, choose an exercise with a good SFR or just choose an exercise and see what the SFR is. And if it's good, keep it. Use it for a few months until it feels meh, and you know damn well there's either another exercise you have that's probably higher SFR that you can't wait to try, or another exercise or a machine in the gym that you don't know what the SFR is, but you're willing to bet it's better than meh. Finish your meso, deload, switch exercises, and that's how you choose the best exercise for you. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Catch more of our nerdy stuff in our members channel, link below, and the Team Forum Forum is just teeming with life thousands, at least more than a thousand, of members want to answer your questions. I'm in there doing expert shit, answering questions, doing lives and all that stuff. Programs included, diets included. Come join us. Link in the description. I'll see you guys next time. And of course, in the comments.